And when you're there for about two or three minutes and your eyes begin to adjust to this painful blackness, you see in the middle of the room there's one candle that's burning. And by the genius of the designer, the candle is reflected through water and through metal and through mirrors until it becomes in front of your eyes a million little pinpoints of light in the sea of blackness. And there's a tape recording, a voiceover, that does nothing but recite names. Hein Greenberg, three years old, Warsaw. Leia Goldberg, seven years old, Sarajevo. Names, 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 till you can bear it no longer. And as I ran from the room, the blinding Jerusalem sunlight came now giving me. I thought to myself for the first time in my life, my name is not on the tape. I'm of the age. <coughs> My name is not on the tape. And if I may, I borrow a phrase from Lincoln. I highly resolve that if my name is not on the tape, I'm still going to try to do something. I'm still here. I'm going to open the second ninth grade in the school. I can't pay for the first one, but I'm going to try and open the second one. We used to take in 18 boys in ninth grade. This year we have 34. I used to travel four or five times a year to speak to Jewish communities. I travel four or five times a month. What I can do, I'm going to try and do, because I'm, I'm alive. I'm here. I have a purpose. <laughs> and every Jew should feel that way. There is no extra Jew in the world. When we began the long exile 1922 years ago, there were about 12 and a half million Jews in the world. One tenth of the Roman Empire was Jewish. 1922 years later, we're still about 12 and a half, 13 million people. I need to place it into a clearer perspective. The estimates are that there were about six, seven million Chinese in the world then. Today there are a billion, six hundred million Chinese. The Torah told us that in advance, you're going to be the smallest of all people. Only Rubchen, not by numbers, shall we try it. But by the quality of each individual. How can it be that after what has happened to us, Jews should not realize where their best interests lie? Don't people want to have Jewish grandchildren? Don't they want to be remembered? Don't they want to be part of eternity and destiny? Do they want to go into the night unknown and uncared for? How can Jewish communities that provide every service imaginable, who have the finest bowling alleys, the most Olympic swimming pools, the best basketball court, not provide for their own children and grandchildren the opportunity to have the heritage of the ages. To give them something that no one can take from them. And that will last through exile and storm and fire and disappointment and economic recession. I just thought of it this morning. I got up very early in the morning and I left my house at 5.30. So even at 5.30 with the clock change, it was too early to put on my film. So I came to LaGuardia Airport. So I have a pair of traveling film. My traveling film on my grandfather's. It's his film. 
So they're old and frayed and you can't use them every day. I thought this morning in the airport, I put on this film, I thought to myself, I have my grandfather. I have his legacy. He didn't leave me a nickel. He died and owed twelve thousand dollars on a fifteen thousand dollar insurance policy, but he gave the twelve thousand dollars to four people. He left me something though that no one can take from me. I cannot squander it. That is what we are talking about in Richmond, in Norfolk, in Muncie, in Jerusalem, in London. Wherever the Jewish people and its remnants still exist, there is no easy way to be Jewish. There is no fast fix. It takes a great deal of knowledge, a great deal of experience, a great deal of sophistication to be Jewish. You cannot wait until people are 21 years old and say to them, now you want to be Jewish? Most Jews in this country, their last contact with Judaism was when they were 12 or 13 years old. Would you like to have your politicians have the minds of 12 or 13 years old? And I will not comment on that further. <laughs> Would you like to have your physician? come to them and they'll say, yeah, when I was 45 years old, I decided I'm going to be a doctor. And therefore, here at 46, I've got my shingle hanging out there. You can't be a Jew if you don't know how to be a Jew. And you can't learn how to be a Jew if there is no educational infrastructure in the community. It's as bold as that. And slowly, 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 the Jewish community in this country has taken an intermarriage rate of 72%. That's today's intermarriage rate. That's what it's taken for us to finally realize that somehow there are no easy answers. Would you have an opportunity here in Richmond, as Jews in every community in this country have, of providing that educational infrastructure. Of having schools that would be meaningful, that will teach not just knowledge, but will give a sense of spirituality and eternity, which is the greatest gift that a person can give. And that really is the choice that the Lord gives us. Ayeko, where are you? What do you want to have? Can we ensure Jewish survival? Certainly we can. How can we? By being Jewish. By realizing that Saturday is not Tuesday. By bringing into our home a sense of values and morals. By saying that the prevalent mores of our society are not sufficient to guarantee our survival. The way to prevent AIDS is not through condoms, my friends. The Jewish people are the oldest people on earth. We're over 3,300 years from the revelation on Sinai. We've seen everyone come and go. Atem Eidai, Yulum Hashem. God says, you are my witnesses. And as we have seen in our time, so many things disappear. Let us attempt to retain what will never disappear. Let us try and be eternal. For my child, and for your child, and for someone else's child. It's not just Richmond. What about Roanoke, and what about Charlottesville, and what about Mechanicsville, and what about every place where there's a Jewish child that would like to be Jewish and know them well? We're willing to do it for Russia, for Ethiopian Jews. What about for ourselves? 
you know, said he may not need me, me, me. If I am not for myself, then who will be for me? That's the question of the American Jewish community today. You have here a group of devoted people who are dreaming a dream. The dream is impractical. It can't happen in Richmond. It's never happened before. It's going to be too much money. It's going to milk the resources of the community. Etc. Etc. Don't ever bet against the Jewish dream. <laughs> Don't ever be among the naysayers. The Atem Advekim Ba'ashem Elokechem Chayim Kuchem Hayom. You who are with me, you are all alive today. No one remembers who the wealthiest Jews were in Spain 500 years ago. But everyone remembers who were the leaders of the Torah institutions, the Jews who went into exile, who turned their back on Spain. Everyone remembers Maimonides and Nachmanides and Abarbanel, and the Jews that converted so that they would retain their homes and their palaces and their wealth, lost their future, lost their destiny. I'm not here to lay a heavy guilt trip on you, my friends, even though that's probably what rabbis are for. But that would be discourteous of me. And I want you to enjoy the luncheon that's going to be served after this. <coughs> But I want you to see the opportunity that you have. 20 years from now, 30 years from now, God will help us all gather together, together again. It will be a different Richmond. It will be a different Virginia. <clears throat> Everyone will be touched by it. And we will have inscribed our name in that eternal book of life and of Torah which is the ultimate heritage of our people. I thank you for your courtesy in listening to me. I hope that we'll always hear good news one from another, that it will be a good and happy and healthy year for us and all of Israel and all of mankind, and that we'll be privileged together to see the redemption of Zion and the rebuilding of Jerusalem. Thank you.